If you've followed our show for a while, you'll know that we've highlighted the recent trend that shows young men are becoming more conservative. In fact, by some metrics, although slim, Gen Z is more conservative than millennials, which is the first time a generation hasn't moved leftward in recent American history. On this episode of Forge and Anvil, I am joined by popular content creator George Behizzi as we discuss whether or not young men have what it takes to turn this country around. Welcome, everyone, to Forge and Anvil, where we hammer out uncomfortable conversations to sharpen ourselves for the cultural, political, and spiritual war that we are living in. My name is Connor. I am host of this podcast. I am a husband, a father, and a follower of Christ Jesus, and I am just doing my best to represent him well everywhere I go. That being said, as I mentioned in the cold open, I am joined by George, also known as Be Hizzy, as his... Uh, uh, content creation name goes. So George, feel free to say hi to the audience and let us know a little bit about you and who you are, what you do. Well, first and foremost, that intro, the the timer screen was long, man. It felt like looking at giraffe's neck. We're good. <laughs> we're here now. First and foremost, when I popped into the studio, I thought you were a college student, man. And you're, you're, you're out here talking about you got kids, wife. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. At, at, at the age of 22, right oh, oh yeah i i'm 28 and i forget my age all the time my wife constantly has to remind me oh that's <laughs> awesome that's awesome but uh so you did a lot of that introduction so everyone already knows uh, my name is george i am a, a conspiracy theorist so connor uh, backstage gave me a great compliment so he said his show is about bringing people from the right with different ideas you know, all over the spectrum. You know, that's the only thing I believe is on a spectrum. You know, <laughs> gender's on a spectrum. No, no, right wing conservatism is on a spectrum. So I am really far. I'm a conspiracy theorist. So I'm glad to be here. And I really got into the election integrity space after 2020. In January, I remember on January 6th, I was live. I was doing a live stream watching January 6th, and I thought it was a great day of patriotism. And I felt those people's grievances were legitimate about the, the election in 2020. It's funny because back then you couldn't talk about it on YouTube. But now, oh, yeah, you can say whatever you want. Right. So that's where I, uh, I got started. I started talking about election integrity, audits going on across the country, co covering a few different states. Arizona was really the main one. I would cover uh, what was going on there in their state legislature, pushing for an audit, all of that. Ended up going to Arizona twice. And anyways, long story short, we're here and we're back. This movement to make America great again is gaining momentum. And the title of your show is just super accurate. Will young men save America? First and foremost, that's sexist. Come on, Connor. What about young women, man? Come on. What about the Emilys and the the, the Delaney's and wh whichever female names I can think of? What, what about that, man? And the Katie Brits. Katie Brits. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. I mean, yeah. Joe Biden delivers the most divisive anger filled I, this guy thought screaming would make him seem more coherent it had the opposite effect but this chick has the opportunity to dunk like kobe bryant when he was alive just dunk just slam dunk and she goes up there she could have won an oscar how bad her acting was if there was a category for terrible performances and i, I thought man at that moment what everyone needed in the country was strength and strength to be projected to them by someone who, you know, exemplified strength. According to Laura Loomer, Vivek Ramaswamy, as Trump would have probably said, Vivek Ramaswamy was supposed to do the rebuttal speech. And I guess they just, Mitch McConnell came in last minute and said, ah, I know I'm resigning in November as minority leader or majority leader up to that point, but just screw this country and give us Katie Britt with an... Well, first and foremost, the only thing they got right was the fact that she was in the kitchen. Boom. Now, now I'm on the same page with you on sexism. There we go. 
Well, thank goodness. Well, I, I've got a lot to lot to say to that, but let's let's go ahead and call that our intro. Let me get to some laundry real quick, and then I'll, I've got a fun story to tell you, George. So, uh, real quick before we get started, everyone, although we are well into it, we'll go ahead and go to our Substack, forgeandanvil.substack.com. If you wish to join us, you can be a, a free subscriber, get some free content and free load off of us, or you can go ahead and uh, give us some support. We appreciate it either way. You can check out our new show, In the Van uh, Exclusives, which is just me in my minivan after a workout, usually in the very early mornings, just breaking down one or two quick uh, news stories for you. And then, of course, be sure to check out last week's episode. We actually did two live streams. We did a Super Tuesday stream with Clint Russell and Andrew Isker, a Boniface option. So again, those are two very different factions of what we would call the right, anything that's not the left, uh, coming together to talk about some timeless stuff. Even though it was Super Tuesday, we definitely talked about some evergreen content. So be sure to check that out. Like and share this video. We are on YouTube, Rumble, and X. Go ahead and repost it wherever you are. And we really appreciate that. Follow me at Forge and A on Twitter or X, whichever you want to call it. Feel free to dead name it if you wish. I do all the time. Anyways, George, that's my laundry list. So I got that out of the way rapidly. So um, I wanted to go ahead and tell you uh, how I initially found you. So I actually found you th through uh, your your content covering uh, the election, the, the most secure election of all time. Um, I, I found you years ago. So this is when I was uh, I was still nothing but a learner. And uh, I'm still a learner. That's all I am. I'm not going to say I'm the master now. But uh I definitely uh, stumbled upon you. Uh, I don't even remember if it was on Rumble. I think it might have been on YouTube before they, uh, you, you know, gave you the boot. But uh, uh, I, I, I liked your stuff. Thought you were funny. You were an entertaining host. And then, um, lo and behold, oh, I man, wait, 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 wait. We had this running joke that everyone that watched that channel was over the age of fifty. I mean, my YouTube demographics: zero people, thirteen to seventeen. Zero people, 18 to 24. Zero people, 25 to 30 something. Man, you were the one 28 year old holding it down. I was, I was your outlier that brought the entire average of your audience age down by a couple decades. So I'm, I'm glad to have been there. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there in age now, man. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching 30. That's gonna, that's you know, gonna be a tough one to, to yeah, tackle. People watching that are going. What do you mean you're getting up there in age? You're 30 <laughs> years old. Just give me 30 years old again. I'd love that. I um, believe it, man. But that's but we look to young people like yourself to carry carry the banner for us us old people. <laughs> so, but no, I, what's funny though is I lost track of you for um for a couple of years, honestly. I I don't know what happened, honestly. I think I I went through a season where I kind of uh cleansed myself of a lot of the politics. Um it was a short season, but for some reason I just lost track of you and I I wasn't listening to as many shows and then a while back about a year ago I was like I'm going to I'm going to see if that be hizzy guy is still doing stuff. Lo and behold, you were still alive and well and then very re Imagine recently I, I checked back in on you. Imagine, Imagine if I you, wasn't oh. doing stuff, man. We, we wouldn't be. We here. wouldn't we would be here today. We, we, we would not be here. Yeah, it's good to it's good to catch up. So you know, your whole whole premise is about young people. What yeah. do you think? What do you think needs to happen? I guess this is supposed to be a question for me, but I, I really want to ask you. What do you think needs to happen for Trump to win in twenty twenty four? I mean, win too big to rig. That's the the new motto now. Or he gets an overwhelming amount of votes. What do you think needs to happen? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, chat. I wanted to say that we will get to your we will get to your messages. So uh, don't you worry about it. Um, but uh, yeah, wh when it comes to what Trump actually has to do to win, uh, you know, honestly, uh, there's a, there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid. I don't know if you saw just today something I was going to talk to you about is the RNC. Apparently, uh, as of a couple hours ago, they were reporting that uh, about 60 different staffers just got canned from the RNC. So I think cleaning house in the RNC is a good step. Uh, ultimately, though, if you, if you really want to know my thoughts, I think that the election, specifically presidential, uh, first of all, I don't think it's the most important thing that there is, but I do want to win it. So to talk about what Trump can do first, I think he needs to focus in mostly on Georgia, Arizona and Wisconsin. I think those are the three states that it's all going to boil down to looking at the electoral map. 
Um, now, I mean, there's some Biden's had some troubles in Michigan, so maybe we can find a pickup there, but I'm not banking on it. Michigan's got Detroit and Pennsylvania. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's got Philadelphia and, uh, you know, these big urban centers are hard to overcome because the machines there are, they're well, well oiled machines for, uh, the Democrat get out the vote operations. Um, you know, however you want to categorize those. Um, but I really think that, uh, a lot of the stuff that groups like Turning Point Action are doing, uh, they're actually doing the important stuff of actually getting people to chase ballots. Uh, Scott Pressler, guys that's like that. Probably uh, where that's that's probably where. First of all, I don't want to interrupt you while you talk about what needs to happen in November. I don't understand this push for ballot harvesting. It's nonsensical. And the reason I say that is. It, it stems from a lack of understanding of the system because hmm. I think a lot of people want this idea that we can beat Democrats at their own game. The problem is the game isn't fair. The game is rigged. It's not like, oh, if we suddenly start participating in this game, the playing field would be even. No, Democrats are the referee. Can't play your opponent at their own game if the referee will treat you differently. So, yeah. and, and so Lara Trump, the new co-chair of the RNC came out and said, we need a, we're going to, you know, fund this ballot harvesting operation for 2024. And, you know, that sounds sexy, but if you really think about it, ballot harvesting is illegal in most states and in most swing states as well. And the real problem Republicans face is, for example, just today, it was revealed to one of my friends in Arizona that there's some some homeless shelter or some homeless place with 80 people registered. That's that's what Republicans are fighting against. They're fighting against phantom voters, phantom names. Los Angeles County was forced by Judicial Watch's lawsuit to remove 1.2 million names off their voter rolls. So why why do you have 1.2 million ineligible names? Why? What, what do you what could possibly be the reason you have that many names? I mean, look, if the IRS saw you move, they update their status real quick to send you, you know, updated requests to pay taxes. But, but with voter registration, oh, we just don't know why we, we need to have all these bloated voter rolls. So th but that's the game. Democrats inflate those rolls right before the election and they utilize them during the election cycle the period of voting, mail-in voting, early voting, and on election day, not election day, really, because people have to show up and, you know, it takes balls for someone who isn't legal and eligible to vote to show up and vote. It takes more balls than that. But with mail-in voting, there's no verification, right? These people are saying no ID. I watched Chris Cuomo with a serious face say he doesn't support voter ID because he has not seen evidence of voter ID lead to more fraud. I'm like, Chris, the, the point of not having ID is that you wouldn't be able to detect fraud if it happened. So what do you mean you haven't seen evidence that it leads to more? The point is that there is more because there's no ID. Anyways, so you have these Democrats pushing for, for these things, pushing for their operation with mail-in voting. And then Republicans are going to come along. Let's ballot harvest. Bar ballot harvesting is limited in almost every state to you collecting ballots for your immediate family member. When you watch a video of some Democrat operative putting in 50 ballots, that means 50 people live in their households. Or the only other exception is someone designates you as their official ballot mailman and you you know, put, put the ballot into the drop box. I think what I want is early voting in person if we're gonna encourage people to turn mm -hmm. out and vote if they can't do it on election day, early voting in person. Or the only way I get behind mail-in ballots, if you if you grab every mail-in ballot you can, chase all of them, that's what they're calling it, and just deliver it in person on election day or just in person in general. I I just believe there's there's too much there's too much of a timeline to have shenanigans pulled between the time you deliver it and the time uh, it gets counted. So all we have to do is is reduce that time to days or hours. So deliver on election day if you have to. Vote the day before or the day before that. Just make sure that you see the process at work 
And if something goes wrong, you can document it. So I understand what Turn Turning Point USA is trying to accomplish. And that's great. I love what the grassroots at their organization is doing, but they're missing the mark when it comes to an understanding of ballot harvesting. So I'll have this debate with him anytime. Charlie Kirk, man, anytime, any place, anywhere. I'm available, man. <laughs> Fight anybody like Floyd Mayweather. All the world champions. Yeah. Well, hey, maybe I can set that up. I I, I don't think I can get Kirk on here, but I, I could probably get uh, Representative Austin Smith on here. He's been on the show before. Or maybe maybe that'd be a fun conversation to talk about it because I'm, I'm by no means an expert. I mean, as far as the purpose behind it, I would say... And again, I'm no expert, so I'm not I'm not uh, able to give you a full breakdown of all the ins and outs. But I'm I'm no slouch either. Uh, but I would really say, just thinking about it um, uh, simplistically, uh, the the ultimate goal is, I think, to try to get out as much of our low propensity voters as possible, so that if there's going to be shenanigans, they have to try really hard to do those shenanigans. And, you know, just, just someone who I'm, I'm by no means an accelerationist, but I do believe that a lot of people woke up after 2020 because of the craziness. And so in my mind, if we make the lift so much heavier for the Democrats that they have to do something so much more flagrant, I think in the end, it will be a net positive in regards to it will wake more people up. And I do think that when people are woken up, even if we don't have the seats of power, I do think that that is still a threat to their agenda. They can't push as far. I mean, a prime example right now would be the border. Democrats right now gave us a horrible border security bill. And as a result of that horrible border security bill not passing because it was really a Ukraine funding bill and it was legalizing uh, a ton of illegal immigration. I can't remember the number off my head, but it was a good like five 5,000 a day or something like that. Um, that are allowed before anything would be triggered. And then once it's triggered, Joe Biden or whoever's in office can just say, ah, it's not actually an emergency and wave it anyways. Um, so it really, it, it did not secure the border in the least. And it gave, it gave b b b b billions of money over to Ukraine and Israel. So once that, once that bill didn't pass though, the Democrats are now trying to spin that saying that Republicans are the ones that are not wanting to secure the border. Causing the border disaster by not, yep. you know, signing this bill and, yeah. And the reason why I'm hopeful about that is because they know that the open border is not popular. So even though they have the most seats of power, they know that enough people are against it that they cannot advocate for open borders. So although they are still doing it in in name, we know that the Overton window has at least shifted our direction. And so I think the more people that wake up, the harder it is for them to get away with things. And the more that people can pressure their local offices to just tell the the federal government to go pound sand. Now, obviously we need to work about actually getting people into offices that have a spine. There are very few of those. That's a whole gripe that the right has been talking about for a long time. But either way, I do think that people are waking up and we are starting to see some positive change in that regard. And okay. there's a lot more That's that I can say. But a really good point, Connor. First and foremost, I agree with getting out low propensity voters. I think people that will never vote or some that, you know, rarely vote. I, I think it's important to get them out. And if they decide I'm going to vote by mail, great. But I, I'm against telling people that have been voting in person or early in person to suddenly start believing mail-in voting is the way to go. That's, that's the only distinction. So we will agree on the uh, low propensity voter thing. Now, your second point, which you mentioned a few minutes ago, is, you know, we have to win the national election, but that's less important than some statewide races. And honestly, I 50-50 agree with you. I used to agree with you almost 80% that, you know, lower uh, local races were more important, like district attorney races were so important, way more important than, than the federal races. But now I'm 50-50 because I believe change used to happen from the bottom up, but I think change is supposed to happen and needs to happen from top down. I think that's the change that shocks the system. I think this country needs a revival and not just a revival in a political sense, but a Christian revival, an idea yeah. and a belief in people that there's a God that exists and we're accountable to him. And so our actions should line up with, it, with his requirements. So I, I think when your leaders are having, you know, homo activities in Senate buildings, 
it doesn't really leave a great message to heaven that righteousness can be found here. So I think we need we need to really have righteousness be exemplified by the leadership. I mean, if you look in the Bible, Ahab and Jezebel, it's a prime example of how two people's actions led an entire nation astray. These guys decided to start doing outrageousness, perverting the house of God, doing abominable things that we probably can't even talk about because we're on YouTube here. And that led to the entirety of the population walking astray, just going astray blindly, right? And it's a, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual sense. They didn't have to see all of the corruption that was going on. But when your leaders leave your nation captive to demons, that's what leads to a perverted society. So everything happening in Congress is happening locally because it started happening in Congress or in the White House. The, the amount of Satanism and just spiritual perversion that's taking place in the higher places of yeah. office has been brought in to the local areas, into the people's hearts. So imagine a radical shift where you have a leader that goes, nah, we're going to bring God back into the schools. We're going to fight for righteous principles. We're going to prosecute people that commit crimes. And we're actually going to stand for the values uh, that are very clearly written out in the Bible. What, what I think will happen is the nation will suddenly realize, wait, I don't have to derive my value from cutting off my balls and changing my <laughs> my person. I don't have to derive, derive my value from sexuality. I can just be a person. So I, I think a, a shift nationally will lead to changes locally, whereas it used to be locally and then nationally. It's the other way around. That. So that's, that's, why, that's the kind of area I think we're in. Now, your yeah. third point, which I think is super important about the Overton window shifting towards more people understanding what's going on with the border. And I didn't really think about this until you brought it up, but more people is in not just Republicans waking up, but Democrats are waking up. Yep. And they're waking up in blue cities. You have yep. people in Chicago running into the city council saying, we're voting red. We're going to vote all of you guys out. And even if it's just 10% of Chicago that's thinking that way. It's huge. It's still a huge number. And I wonder if you're an election. Imagine you're an election official. and you're you're not happy with the direction of the country, but you you can't be no Republican out in the public. Are you really going to work to pull shenanigans off, or are you going to be like be like in the back of your mind, like I, I hope Trump gets it and deports all these people? Because <laughs> I, I think those people understand what's going on. Like in Denver, some of those people that were laid off recently by the governor, sorry, the governor, uh, not not the governor, the mayor. See, here, here's what he did to save himself, Andrew, or not Andrew, Connor. Connor, he said they don't call them layoffs. It's just pay reductions and hour reductions. So he reduced certain people's hours to zero. <laughs> That's a layoff. If, if you were working eight hours every day and you now work zero hours, you've been laid off. Yep. But so he was like, oh, we'll just reduce their hours to 0 0.5, 30 minutes a day. And, and we won't call it layoff. But imagine you're that person. And these are the most involved civic people because they work in government. They're probably going to end up working in election offices or they know friends that work in election offices. Are they really going to be trying to pull shenanigans for Joe or are they going to be like, hey, I'm just going to let this Trump ballot slide through and just count? That's what I think is going to start happening. And they don't even anticipate the feeling that a lot of Democrats are having right now. Yeah. I agree with you. I mean, you're you're completely right, and I think I think the the biggest thing that you pointed out that I would just give a huge hearty amen to is the the spiritual warfare aspect. You know, the reality is that is the that is the most important thing. Um, you know, I've been telling people I've been I've been invited to speak to a couple of different groups recently, and I've been telling people. Uh, you know, because I, I usually get asked some form of question as to, you know, why are you focusing on politics? Um, you know, and I always tell people it's for the it's for the short term wins, um, but the culture is for the long term wins and the spiritual is for the eternal wins. Um, and, you know, that's that's where I'm really trying to do what I can to bring a biblical worldview into this show, whether we're talking about uh, nitty gritty election integrity, integrity uh, initiatives, which, by the way, may have got us bumped from YouTube. I don't know. Apparently, YouTube's not working is what I keep hearing from 
uh, different people contacted me on my socials. Um, so we'll see. I don't know um, if we're up on YouTube right now or not. You're not um, even live on YouTube. It, it says it's been waiting since 10 years. Yeah, apparently. Apparently it's, it's, it's still end. waiting. So, but we're live on X and Rumble. So, you know, there we go. At least we have, we have backups. We, we have contingency plans, everyone. But uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a lot of what I've been um, talking about. Like the, like the, the crux of this episode is will young men hey, be able to save question. this Republic? How do, up, how do you set up your live streams? Like what program do I use? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know the, the actual method of it? Do you go in, into the YouTube studio and go live and then create stream schedule? I do not. I, I use a program that, uh, that schedules it out for me and I'm, I'm synced up and this is the first time I've ever had this happen. So it's fishy. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fishy. They probably saw Be Hizzy on the title and were like, oh, kill the stream. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen it live for since forever. Man, gotta love it. It says we're live on Rumble. And so we and I see that we're live on on X. So unless something's happened there, we should be Yep, we're we're still live on those platforms. So I guess we'll download this and maybe throw up a pre recorded version of this. Mm -hmm. Um for the YouTube overlords. So um, I don't know what's going on there, but, but yeah, I mean, young men, whether or not they can save this country. So um, George, what do you think is drawing young men to become more conservative? Cause right now I feel like there's a lot of young men asking questions about faith. Not all of them are in the church though. Uh, we did an episode just the other week about the manosphere and how the church can reach out to men in the manosphere because there's, you know, there, the manosphere does a good job of pointing out some truths but oftentimes their prescription uh, is is incorrect. And so the church is really constantly asking that question. And I think there's a lot of uh, un unnecessary femininity in the church among pastors who really just don't don't want strong men in the church because I think it will challenge their leadership potentially. That's some of the things that we talked about in that episode. But uh, but either way, when it comes to politics, at least young men are trending conservative. So do you think it's the messaging? Do you think it's the fact that Trump and and people that have come after the Trump wave are starting to uh, to have a more positive message of what we're actually trying to build in the future as opposed to just how we can lose slower? What do you think it is? Well, I would never allege that Republicans are competent in any way whatsoever. <laughs> I think nor would I. I think it's a number of things. Trump is generally super popular. I don't care what the polls say. Oh, his favorability is forty four percent. No. Most people I talk to like Trump across all age groups. He's the most talked about president ever. I think he is polarizing because he's popular. And when mm -hmm. someone's popular and they talk about controversial subjects, you'll have people from one side that are super loud and people from the other side that are also vocal and people in the middle who don't want to say they're supporting the guy that everyone else on the crazy side says they will never support, he's destroying women's rights, blah, blah, blah. I think I'll credit a lot of younger men that I know to listening to Andrew Tate's message. I, I know it's, it's a hilarious thing, but I think for a long time, you'll go on Twitter and you'll read from some conservative, get married, have a bunch of kids. And it's like you said, the manosphere has done a really good job. And to the people watching who are like, well, what's a manosphere? Well, it's it's basically these guys that call themselves themselves red pill and they believe modern dating is irreparably damaged and men need to you know adapt accordingly. But the solutions they give to the various problems they identify, which by the way are legitimate problems, yes, are just not great solutions. Like, oh. You can have as many women as you want. And then they'll usually quote examples from the Bible like, oh, look, Solomon had 700 wives. Well, the Bible says things, but it doesn't endorse everything, right? The Bible right. documents history, but it's not out here saying, go have 500 wives. No, it's not saying that. So the manosphere is wrong in its prescription of the problems that are rightfully identified. I think when conservatives come around, and just, you know, say messages like have kids and don't, it doesn't matter if you, it's, it lacks the idea that people are genuinely, genuinely terrified of the divorce courts. They're terrified of family laws and how easily 
imagine you build something and you get married for a year and she takes half. Like people are terrified of those things because it's it's happening. And you know, to the you know, I, I don't know who maybe Jack Posobiec is one of the people I, I follow that says these things. I have a bunch of kids. I agree in, a, in an ideal world. That's true. But you have to have a message that's more nuanced than that. So what Andrew Tate did, he came along and, and identified problems. And he just he just showed himself as a cool guy that's capable of solving problems via his lifestyle. And so people wanted to be like him, believe it or not. I know a lot of young 18-year-olds that are going to be voting for Trump, probably only because they watched Andrew Tate. One of my you know, gym partners that I used to regularly do workouts with, he is a high schooler that's graduating t- in two months. And he's only really conservative because he was watching Andrew Tate tell him playing video games is for sissies. Since we're on Rumble, we can see <laughs> And... I- he's like, well, he stopped playing video games and he works out. He started working out. And and now he's open to the conservative world and he's reading the Bible. So I, I think God can use anyone to wake up a yeah. contingent of the population. I think conservatives have failed young people, failed the younger generation. Trump understands it. He understands. Can I go on a tangent? Please. Okay. When conservatives complain about how young people aren't conservative or black people aren't conservative, it's it's not it's not rooted out of a genuine place. It's coming from a place of almost entitlement. Like you voted Democrat, that failed you. You should just vote for us. No, right. that's not how it works, right? Jesus Christ did not just stand somewhere and say, "Come to Christ." All right, come to no. He visited people in their homes. So when Republicans never show up to a an inner city election, they never even run candidates in some of these cities. They don't knock on doors in these cities, and then expect these cities, when their Democrats fail, to consider them as an alternative. That's just disingenuous because you didn't show up for those people. You didn't try to sway them. You didn't try to bring them into your coalition. You didn't try. Rapport is important. When Donald Trump was campaigning everywhere, people thought he was crazy. I think Trump won in 2016 largely because he was he wasn't afraid to go out into a giant city like Phoenix, right? Most Republicans would just go out into the wider areas to the surroundings right. He's in the heart of the city, talking to people of all colors, of all walks of life, and he's just being himself. He's not being fake. So that's one thing. Republicans don't show up in person. They don't try to engage in what these people are interested in, these platforms they're interested in. Young people don't care about watching a radio show from, you know, some guy from 50 years ago. And and that's how they'll they'll watch a short 60 seconds. They'll watch it. So you need to show up where they are. Second, second, very important thing here. And I believe it's super important. If you watch countries like Argentina and and El Salvador. And the things these countries share in common is the amount of young people supporting right wing leaning presidents. I mean, Javier yeah. Mille is a full blown libertarian and social democracy is usually associated with younger people, meaning they're willing to buy it because they're more gullible. But I'll tell you one thing, young people are gullible. Yes. But if you come along with good ideas and you are as passionate about your good ideas as the left is with their bad ideas, they'll resonate with you. And that's why you see someone like Javier Mille or Naib Bukele become so popular with their people because they, they believe in their ideas so much. They're willing to be radical about what they say. When conservatives in America are complaining about young people, why would you want a young person or why would you think a young person would be interested in you when you're just a Democrat moderate you're just a democrat you're why would a young person be excited to vote for mitch mcconnell or john cornyn or lindsey graham what, what what do you think would make them excited about these people they're excited about trump because trump speaks like them trump is on stage making jokes he has a sense of humor he's not a stuck-up politician who has never really had a real job in his life trump has worked he has been with the people 
He has employed people. He can relate with just about every normal person that's not a politician. So, again, why would you complain about young people not voting conservative when all you give them are Mitch McConnell types? Do you really think that young person whose life has been ruined by the Democrat Party is really going to look at Mitch McConnell and go, you'll solve my problems? No, they'll look at Trump <laughs> and go, wow, he stands for something. So authenticity is super important to young people. And having someone with that vibrance is super cru crucial. Look at Vivek. Vivek has a bunch of young people supporting libertarianism in a fiscal sense, as in the government should be small in a fiscal sense, which is what I am. I believe in Christian values. I believe we, we, we shouldn't just allow weed, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm also about tiny government from a bureaucratic perspective. It's, it's about authenticity. It's about being cool and relatable. And that's why younger people are going towards Trump. It's not because of conservatism or Republicans or even the Democrats' failures. I think it has the Democrat failures have something to do with it. But I think it's because for once in so many decades, Republicans have a president or a leader, Donald Trump, who resonates with them. Yeah. I completely agree. And, you know, love him or hate him. I think that Trump is a once in a century politician that really he's going to define uh, a lot of the next several years, if not decades after he is uh, out of politics altogether. Uh, you know, um, and I and I have my beats with him and the audience knows I thought that 2020 could have been handled better. But it's also easy to armchair quarterback this thing and pretend that, you know, we, we would have done do everything so much better. better? Uh, main thing is, I think that the spending in COVID, I think that Trump could have been more, uh, more vocal about not shutting down. I know that he left up. Okay. Numbers, yeah, we agree. But, <laughs> we you know, agree. we agree yeah. 100%. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, I mean, ultimately, though, I, I still think that whether, whether you think that or not, you know, if nothing else, he is a, a symbol. Um, he, he is a symbol saying that you don't approve of the current regime. I mean, if if nothing else, that's what you're voting for Trump. What that's what your vote for Trump says. Um, whether you're actually like a in a MAGA cult, and there is a, there is a degree of people that are truly cultish about Trump, and um, but then there's just individuals like us. They're just normal guys that are like, man, I just I'd love it if we don't go into World War Three. So you know, if <laughs> if we can maybe just do that, you know, that that maybe that's a, a small ask that we could uh, vote for when we ask for someone who's better on foreign policy than Joe Biden. You know, I mean, it's. Yeah. It's not asking a lot. And then, of course, Trump, uh, whether you think that he's a truly regenerate Christian or not, he at least pays lip service to Christianity. I think that's important. Um, you know, he recently spoke at the uh, uh, the uh, religious broadcasters convention. I don't quite remember the title of that convention, but uh, he spoke at it saying how um, under his next administration, like no one will, will touch the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, and of course, that's got everyone talking about Christian nationalism and a giant uproar. But, you know, the, the reality is, I think it's still important that we have a leader that at least acknowledges our Christian heritage we because we were that? a Christian country. I don't understand how all Christians aren't nationalist. I don't understand which part of the Bible instructs some of these people to stay out of politics or out of the world. I mean, Jesus in the book of John literally says, Lord, I pray you don't take them out of this world. But that as they go in the world, you help them. I wish I could quote the exact verse, but it's in the book of John. Uh, Jesus asking God not to take his disciples. All right, you know, I'm going to read it. Okay, John 17. John 17, verses 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's a very important prayer. It's not talking mm -hmm. about death. It's talking about like death of his disciples. No, it's talking about what he expects from his church, his ecclesia, his body. He's not asking God to just uproot it from the world like right away, but instead that God keeps them from the evil one. Now, oh, what, what is the world? I mean, the world is not earth. That's not the earth is different from the world, right? The earth. God could have just said God created the world. No, God created the earth. And then he created the world. The world is the society, the various societies that exist within earth. That's the world. And God is saying to, or Jesus, yes, God is saying 
don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. Meaning as they are in this sick place, they are they become beacons and ambassadors of the truth, which is Jesus Christ in the world. Now, how, how do you become a beacon? It's not just screaming about Christ, but showing the love of Christ. Because loving God is not just, Lord, I really love you. I just uh, mentally really love you, right? It's about your, your conduct in society, how that, re how that represents Christ. I think we need more Christian businessmen who rule and control companies the way Christ would yeah. if he had a company, right? I, I think when we talk about ministry, we should ministry shouldn't just be sitting on a pulpit you know, or standing on a pulpit, rather. Some ministers sit if they're Chris Christie and can't stand for more than five seconds. <laughs> standing for, you know, an hour and preaching about revelations, about the world or about about something in, in the Old Testament. No, it's ministry. That's, yeah, of course, that's important. That ministry is important. But the ministry that has been neglected is the ministry of going out into the world and making every nation disciples. You, Christianity is, or not Christianity, Christians in this country are incredibly uh, privileged to be in a society that was built by Christians, and as John Adams said, for Christians, and yep. they're letting that go because they shouldn't be involved in government because some, um, which Bible verse says that? Which Bible verse says Christians shouldn't be involved in government? Because I was under the assumption that bringing the kingdom of God, uh, the kingdom of God is a system of government uh, it, it, ruled by government uh, or ruled by God and his people in conjunction. You read that in Revelations, how Jesus will set up his kingdom and his you know servants, his uh, saints will rule alongside him. They will judge alongside him because they'll be full of righteousness. So if that's the kingdom of God in perfection, then surely when God's people are, are in this broken world, the idea is for us to represent to this broken state the true perfect kingdom of God. So I think we need to we need to have a lot more Christians involved in politics. It doesn't mean Christians join secular circles and start making music that that is obviously worshiping of Satan, but it means Christians having a say in crucial topics. It means Christians actually saying abortion is wrong, and this is what the Bible says on it. It means Christians calling out churches that will never talk about things like abortion. Dude, there are churches that believe everything about the Bible, except where it says every child was formed in the womb, and God, Jesus, was knitting them together. Don't believe that, but ah, abortion, yeah, just do you. It's it's we're not even supposed. We're just passengers. Yep. We're, we're 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 citizens of heaven. Yeah, of course, we're citizens of heaven, and God has sent us on this mission trip to this broken world, and we're in this Airbnb, the society we're in, and our job is to leave it clean, make sure it's cleaner than when we found it for the next traveler. So that's that's why we have to um, work to ensure that the society we're in represents Christ at every level, institutions, schools, boom, everything. Yeah, I agree. In fact, when I, uh, uh, to finish up my story, when I finished, uh, when I first uh, came back to, to search for you again in recent times, I saw that you had Nate Fisher on, you had David Reese on your show, and Nate Fisher's been on my podcast, and then David Reese, him and I have been actually working out of time for him to come on the podcast. And these are guys that are just focused on on building um, you know, rebuilding Christendom, meaning just, uh, you know, uh, Christian culture and Christian countries that actively want to serve um, and honor God. And, you know, I, I think most people are afraid because we, we've had a a couple decades of evangelical leaders, um, you know, who we nowadays deem Big Eva, uh, who have really uh, talked to us about not hurting our witness. And we need to be winsome in order to, to win people over. And so uh, these these individuals are scared to get into politics because it breaks the 11th commandment of thou shalt be nice. 
when in reality, uh, they, they oftentimes ignore uh, other uh, commandments that are actually in the Bible uh, in order to not break that, uh, that uh, imaginary 11th commandment. But the parable of the talents is really one that really freed me up in my thinking because the parable of the talents, uh, first of all, some translations, the master, when he gives the talents uh, to his servants, he tells them to occupy until I return. Or some translations say, do business until I return. And so the wicked servant was not, was not just wicked because he put his talent in the ground, but he was wicked because he refused to obey his master. His master told him to do business until I arrive. And he specifically did it. He told his master, I was concerned that you were a hard master, sowing and reaping where you reaping where you did not sow. And so essentially what he's doing is he's telling the master, you know, I, I knew that you were going to be this harsh, cruel judge. And so then the master says, okay, well, what you thought I was, that's how I'm going to judge you. And so that's why the wicked servant is thrown out into utter darkness where there's wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's because he assumed that he was serving a hard master. And that to me is one of the things that really freed me up to start actually engaging with culture because I was so scared in the beginning of hurting my witness as well. I was so scared of getting something theologically wrong because I'm a theological midwit. midwit. Um, I was also so scared of, of uh, hurting someone and therefore hurting my witness that they wouldn't be able to be won over by Christ, which first of all, I've, I've definitely learned over the years that uh, giving a watered down version of the gospel is not actually going to win anyone it's over. It's literally <laughs> stupid. Because it, it is. First of all, that means you don't believe the Holy Spirit is who the Holy Spirit says he is. The yeah. Holy Spirit is the comforter. You or you have to do. God is like, just plan it. My Holy Spirit's going to come through and make sure it's irrigated. Get, get that water into that seed. Make sure that seed becomes something. If that yeah. seed accepts Christ. Yeah, because of course, yeah. seeds, you could throw a seed in, in certain hearts and certain hearts are just not receptive to the gospel. But exactly. your, your job is to do it. Your job is to preach the real gospel. Imagine yeah. being incredibly hungry. You're just, you're, oh, you just need something to eat. Like it's the craziest hunger in the world. And then out of nowhere, some guy's like, hey, man, I got some food for you. And then he pulls out of his bag cotton candy cotton candy or marshmallows and he's yeah. like let's let's eat marshmallows to quell your hunger no this guy's hungry for salvation <laughs> he's hungry to know where where he's going to go after he dies and you selfish bastard sorry <laughs> bad word but you're going to you're going to look him in the face and say oh you you can just be a you could be a good person and that's how you get into god's kingdom you know you you just Jesus loves how homo you are. He don't he don't think you need to change anything at all. That, that's crazy. That's absolutely ridiculous. So yep. Christ requires us to preach the truth and yep. allow him to put the truth in water in that person's heart. Yep. And it'd be selfish for us to just believe, oh, this guy's feelings, you know, his feelings are too, you know, tender. We don't want to hurt hurt the person's feelings. No, that's not our job. What if we say something to someone and that's what stops them from eternal death? Because that's what we're stopping them from. Exactly. So. Yeah. And that and that goes to kind of my last point with the parable of the talents, which is that, you know, you're going to get some things wrong, but that's where you need to recognize that you don't serve a hard master. You serve a master that has grace to cover you. So you might you might be you might be well intentioned and you're taking this hard stance on something that maybe biblically you shouldn't or maybe maybe you just sin in your uh you know in your in your zealous uh nature, but at the end of the day, you don't serve a hard master. His his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he has grace for you that he will cover you even when you're wrong. So do your best to use scripture to guide your your uh, engagement in the public sphere. Um, but don't be afraid to engage in the public sphere out of a fear of, of sinning or hurting your witness because at the end of the day, if you truly are coming at it from a heart of, of, of servant's heart of wanting to genuinely bring about the gospel in all areas of your life, including the public square, which the public square demands that sometimes you, you go into the temple and flip some tables and, and uh, create a whip, you know, uh, sometimes you're going to have to take those hard stances. And if you're scared of, of sinning or hurting your witness, just remember that there's grace to cover you. 
So, I mean, there's a lot more that I could go on there. And I know, George, you and I could probably go all night and uh, make this thing into a three-hour stream. But um, I promised you I'd wrap it up after about 45 minutes. And we've already gone a, a little over. So um, feel one free to share thing. any closing thoughts. One, one more thing on, on just all of that. I think people in the Christian world that aren't involved in any civic society whatsoever in government, or any institutional uh, society or any business society, one of the things they, they'll look to are the Bible verses that seemingly condemn business, condemn someone with material wealth, like in terms of money on the earth. They'll go, oh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a needle through uh, a camel's camel eye. through the eye of a needle. Yeah. yeah, camel through the eye of a needle. And they don't understand the context Christ is saying those things in. First of all, if you look into the book of James, I believe, it's made very clear that the definition of a poor man, if you look at the context of um, past verses, the, I, the definition of a poor person, a lowly person, is one who is humble. That's the definition. And a rich person would therefore be one who is not Humble. humble. Yes. So that's the most important part. And what, what is the humility? What what's what are they looking? Of course, Christ is mentioned. He is talking about material wealth. And he tried to make a point that that's not going to get you in that you can't buy your way into heaven one. But then you also can't believe that your own hands can get you into heaven, that your own action is what equals heaven. And so he's making the point that your money is literally, it's impossible for you, this rich man here, to go get into heaven because you're rich. No, you get into heaven because you're born again in Jesus Christ. That's it. And, and, and so that's why Jesus is like, if you even look at a woman in lust, to God, you already committed adultery. Mm -hmm. Now, in your eyes, you're like, oh, I just look, I didn't like have like intercourse. But, but no, God... Christ was making the point that God's standard for what, what is sin and what is not is so high that you couldn't, you can't not sin. It's in your nature to yeah. you, you, you're going to look at this woman. And so Christ is like, well, but I'm here to say, I'm the one that's not going to lust with a woman in my heart. I'm the one that's not going to steal lie ever. I'm perfect. I'm that spotless lamb. I'm the one that's going to be questioned. Remember during Whenever the people would provide a lamb for sacrifice, they would scrutinize every lamb and make sure it was spotless. Around the exact same week, God is so smart. Jesus was getting questioned by the Romans. Are you who you say you are? He's like, all right, if you think I am. And at the end, guess what? They were like, oh, this one's spotless. We find no, no wrong in him. Remember, Herod and Pilate were like, yo, you're not bad. You're not bad. And they were like, let's release Jesus. And these people were like, crucify him, crucify him. And they're like, well, well we don't think he's guilty of anything. He hasn't, he hasn't committed any crimes to die for. They're like, crucify him. That was God's God using this weird parallel where he's like, well, he's a spotless lamb because he was cleared of all, of all guilt. He did nothing wrong. But because he did nothing wrong, he's perfect. He's perfect for that shedding on the cross. So I, I believe we need to truly understand that it is Christ that saves us. So our, all we have to ask of him is that our actions honor him and they remember him. And I think we'll end up doing better than if we believe that our hands can get us into rooms. We can't open that door. Only Christ does. Hmm. That's why people come to that gate and go, I did all these great things. You know, I did this. I did that. God is like, well, that's what you did, but I don't remember you. Because I didn't know you. You never trusted yeah. me with your life. I don't remember you telling the judge, God eternal, that I paid your price and you accepted, accepted it. I don't remember that. So I don't know you. Anyways, 45 minutes, you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, George. I really appreciate that. And yeah, I, I appreciate your thoughts. You gave me something uh, new to think about as we enter into Easter, the, uh, the spotless lamb was examined to make sure he was truly spotless. And, uh, that cross examination took place with Christ as well. And that's a, that's a great, uh, great way to, to be thinking about it when, as we're, um, you know, a few weeks out from Easter. So thank you for that, George, but uh, where can people go to keep up with you and everything that you're doing? 
Well, yeah, they can go to rumble.com slash behizzy or um, behizzy tweets on, on X, or they can follow um, Firebrand Media. We're on all platforms, YouTube, Rumble, X, all of them, man. We are Firebrand Media. So that'd be uh, greatly appreciated. No. Awesome. Well, thanks again, George. Really appreciate it. And thank you, listener. We really appreciate you consuming this podcast wherever you, uh, whatever platform you may be on. Uh, feel free, if you want to keep up with the show, to go to our Substack, forgeandanvil.substack.com. And you can become a free supporter. Just put in your email. You'll get uh, email updates with uh, written articles as well as uh, just uh, um, updates on the show. And then, of course, you can also pay to get some exclusive content as well. And you can also follow me on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, at Forge and A. We really appreciate you listening to the show. And thanks again, George. And we will see all of you guys next time.